welcome to the good, the bad, and <laughs> the good, the bad. It's because of these my cats. Yeah. The I good, blame the bad that. scars. Yes. <laughs> welcome like to the good, the bad, and the rugby everybody. studio. This is the good, the scars, <laughs> and the rugby. We have taken over. We have invaded the space with the beautiful acoustics, and we're here, uh, of course, in partnership with our friends at Allianz. It's uh, Emily Scarrett in the flesh without a moon boot on. It's Mike Tindall wearing a deliciously fluffy. I just want to touch this jersey. Snuggly. What, what do you call it? A jump. Yeah. Sweater. 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 Sorry. <laughs> and so, Alex Bain. Sweater yeah. is what you wear over your shoulders and tied at the front. Yes, that is what you wear. <laughs> Just on the sweater. Off, off the head, leg, or a boot. So. <laughs> and I've trotted out my best Afrikaans accent just for Alex Payne, who's here as Thank well. Thank you very much, Jan. Though you're a blimp on We had a lot of that. Where was that? In Bermuda. In Bermuda, yes. Jan, they bloomed on And when there is very many South Africans around, I start sounding like this, but I will not do it to you for the next hour, I promise. Do you know, I feel a little bit like I'm in sort of the headmistress's office here. No, Do you know what I mean? We've got perfection no. on either side and you, we've done something wrong. Yeah, well, you have. <laughs> and I've, I've been caught too. I'm dragging you down with me. <laughs> That's the way it feels. Yeah. Emily Scarrett, fresh out of the commentary box that she raced to in order to get there in time for the Barbarians Women Against uh, the Women box. How crazy was the dash to the stadium? Yeah, it was crazy. Um, so obviously the men's game got called off. Then they decided to put the women who were meant to be playing at 5.15 or something mm. into that slot. Um, and my original plan was I was going to obviously come down just for the women's game. So miss the men's traffic if there was any. Um, so I was basically still in my house up in Leicestershire at about quarter past 11 when Sarah Orchard rang me and was like, hey, Skaz, I hear you're in Teddington, but just to let you know, the, the girls game might be moved to 2.30. And I was like, Sarah, I'm not in Teddington. I'm in Leicester. And she was like, oh, how long a journey is that? Like Southerners, they don't know, they know yeah. anything slightly north, do they? Dizzy outside the M25. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I was like, it's about two hours 40 at the moment. And she was like, oh, could you get in the car as quickly as possible? But what she didn't know was I'm down in London all week, so I hadn't packed. I was on crutches at the time because I'd just had my uh, screw out of my foot. So I was hobbling around my house trying to pack for the entire week, trying to get all my stuff in my car and then race down there. And in the end, it was absolutely perfect. I crutched myself into... Crutch, is that a word? It is now. Yeah, it is. yeah we're going with yeah. it. I crutched myself to crutch. into... To crutch. I crutch, do crutch, we crutch. <laughs> to crutch. <laughs> to crutch. <laughs> to crutch. <laughs> Someone who has been in for an ankle operation <laughs> and appears on a, on a TV show late from the Latin crutchate. <laughs> <laughs> Crutch a tam. I crutched yes. into a uh, commentary position literally as the anthem was finishing. So it was... Yeah, almost the personification of perfect timing. Yeah, well, so, well, surprise. <laughs> Kel surprise. Do you know what's really interesting? It happens to Scars again. It's it's that you and I time. can empathise with this. You two think it's pressurised playing rugby and stepping out in the field. The pressure is in the media element of it, in the broadcasting of it, and of trying to get to the right place and face the right direction at the right time. Well, in, all, fa- in all fairness, through your history of... I actually don't know what I'm doing here. Yeah. What? I'm... Uh, I'm so uh, so sorry. One um, minor stain on an eighteen-year broadcast. But, was, uh, thank you. but if you are, it's a fairly you said, large stain. If you, if you are going to fail, fail in the yeah, most. You're going to get it wrong. Right. Go down in in flames. I still go, watch it at least once a week. Right. Go viral. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you're going to go anywhere, just Has go did viral. It, didn't it? Yeah. Yes, he did. He did. <laughs> he got properly done by Greenwood actually, because Will left. Because I was, I threw the question to them, and and they did when had Has had his Xing Zhong meltdown, and I watched. Somebody sent it to, to me the other day. It's the fear in his eyes, which I can really relate to, because you know that what you're trying to say is not coming out as you're intending to. And Will just sort of didn't help him out at any point. He just sort of (laughs) stepped quietly off screen. (laughs) Just like, Homer into the hole. Homer going back into the bush. Yeah, it was a bit like that. Um, Poor old Hoffington. What's the the shortest (laughs) amount of notice you've ever had to get called in off the bench a bit? Do you know, honestly, it's probably the first, it was the first thing I ever did at Sky. And I, I was actually on Sky Sports News at, well, there are two, there are two, very, two very quick answers. I was on Sky Sports News at quarter to midnight on a Friday evening and someone came running in and said, you've got to go home. We need you back in at 4.30 tomorrow morning because you've got a full day of international rugby to present because mm. Simon Lazenby, who was the presenter at the time over here, apparently he'd got an eye infection, <laughs> but it had happened in a pub quite late <laughs> at night and someone else had, I think hit him into an eye infection. So he obviously wasn't <laughs> fit to present. Um, so I came in, I was in at 4.30, I was on air at 6.30, having never, ever done any live broadcasting that wasn't just reading an autocue like a sort of parrot. And that was, that was quite exciting. And I sat with Sean Fitzpatrick, Michael Liner, Bobby Skinstat and Will mm. Greenwood. And I was 
24 and a half <laughs> wondering what earth I was meant to be and doing a complete rugby pig so you would <laughs> be complete rugby oh. and the only thing I don't, know if you can sw- I don't know if you can swear on the good the scale and rugby <laughs> but um, Fitz Fitz as he went 10 right oh no in 10 seconds 9 8 he just leant over and he went don't fuck it up mate and I was like <laughs> Great, three, two, hello, everybody. <laughs> and they just sat like kings with the sort of, like the Werther's original advert. But the, the one I was actually going to mention is we obviously worked together for Sky this summer. And one of the most curious things I've ever had was going on air for the, which game was it where they thought it was going to be cancelled? Oh, it was, it was the, the, Lions. the, it was the Lions playing, it was the last game before, it was when, yeah. when everything went upside down. And what was really odd about that. They were playing that, the Lions, the Lions, the, the Lions. The, yes, the Lions, the Lions, that's, yes. what, that's what I was trying to say. The, but the really odd thing about that is that we went on air mm. with a two-hour build-up without knowing whether we were building up to a game or whether we were going to find out the game had been cancelled. So that's quite interesting in terms of how do you discuss is there going to be a game or not <laughs> going to be a game? And once you've done that, what do you then talk about? <laughs> so it, I think it was only about 20 minutes before kickoff that it was confirmed and the Lions then had a bench with seven forwards and one back on or whatever it was. That, that was quite interesting. That was quite an interesting challenge as to what do you talk about when you don't know what you're trying to get to? Mm. I once was covering a Springbok test in Port Elizabeth and I was told in the first half that the person who was hosting Argentina, New Zealand that evening at one um, back in Johannesburg couldn't make it anymore. So I had to quickly get to the airport, literally got to the airport in 20 minutes because Port Elizabeth is the size of <laughs> like a one pound coin. And then I got to Johannesburg uh, got to the studio and they just literally whizzed me into makeup and clothes and then put me, plumped me on set. And I went, okay, here we go. Let's do this one. Roll so, titles. N- what, what was the time between sitting down and rolling titles? Oh, it was it was super close. But the crazy thing is I had worked on the build-up for, for a test match that I spent the second half in the air for. So yeah. I, like, I had no idea what happened in the Springbok <laughs> test. By the time I landed, it was done and I've managed to catch the highlights in the car on the way into Randburg. But you do have these close shaves. I think it's it's hard to perform when it's that tight. And as a player, I did feel for the girls on the pitch on Saturday because they obviously all really wanted to showcase their talent and what they could bring. And I'm, it must be really tough when you're really amped for a game. Well, well I think it's, it's, it's either tough or you actually quite enjoy that sort of thing. I quite like that. I've, uh, it's happened only a couple of times where I've had quite a big night, Friday night out and then you get called up on the Saturday morning and... <laughs> To, just to play or to commentate? <laughs> to play. Right. And you just don't talk to the coach. Yeah, exactly. And then coughing, and then you, coughing into your boots. Yeah, and then you know you have to play well. <laughs> How long did the girls know then? What was their genuine time from being told to getting there? Because obviously it messes up your routine of your food and eating. And if you have superstitions, that's where <laughs> it can play against you. <laughs> yeah. That's why you should never have a superstition, anyone. Yeah, well, the Springbok women, some of them got there half an hour before kickoff, yeah. apparently. Um, so I don't know how much that gave them in terms of being at the hotel, but they were also in, I mean, taxis and stuff. They were, they also couldn't take their team bus. Yeah. Well, Sarah had rang me and then Mo texted me maybe like half an hour later saying, have you heard what's kicking off? I think we're playing earlier, blah, blah, blah. So they didn't know that early. Like you say, the I don't know whether, do Barbars have team meetings and stuff like that before games? I'm not sure. But normally they have a drinks trolley, I think. <laughs> They'll have a meeting. <laughs> Certainly just waking Whilst up or something. But, coughing. Yeah, but they had to order taxis. They were getting piled in in fours. Um, so it wasn't ideal, is it's it? It's not but, a great look. But the flip side is the opportunity. Oh, unreal. Was unreal. Unreal opportunity. Twickenham, uh, loads of people stayed. I don't know how many tickets they'd sold for the uh, men. Oh, I don't know. Were well, the they had 29,000? 29,000 for the girls. That stayed. World record, right? Yeah. yeah. World record for a standalone women's game, I think, yeah, which was awesome. And do you know what I love about that? I I love the irony that many of those fans weren't there to see them, but stayed. You know, 29,000 people of, you know, maybe 10 really actually came for the women's rugby and the rest just came for rugby, went, oh, the guys aren't pitching up. Well, we'll just stay anyway. But I, I, I think that's a brilliant point. And I would genuinely throughout the challenge that I would go so far as to say even three years ago, I reckon a lot of people would have, yeah. Are gone. I reckon yeah. the progress and the interest and the profile mm. has come such a long way that people will be well, you know, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's going to be a really good game. I think this autumn as uh, well, yeah. the women's game has got a lot of airtime. Yeah. A lot of obviously England smashed their opposition, which isn't always you know what one, what people want to see. But I think the airtime it got, the coverage, the publicity, etc., will have meant that yeah. people prick their ears up to oh, oh yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, I, I maybe think, we should do that more often. Trick right. people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think actually. 
uh, the, the Red Roses doing what they did would have actually massively helped. I think if you're going forward and that trend continues that you're smashing everyone by that point, I think, yes, it has a negative effect, but I think there's been so much hype around it and how good they, how good, how well they've performed throughout that autumn that people probably did want to see those players on show. Plus, you know, the rest of the players who, who all, I mean, it was, a, it was a great, I mean, the tries galore. I know. think as well, for anybody who was a England rugby fan will have come across Rocky Clark, Katie Daly, McLean, Natasha Hunt, all of those guys. So actually, if they pick those names out, they probably were a bit like, oh yeah, obviously it's Katie's last dance as it were, crushed it. Why is she hanging up her boots? Oh, I don't know. She's I mean, got... I love going out at the top, but yeah. there's a lot more there. She's isn't there? pretty I like much Scar- smashed I, that, hasn't I she? I like Scazza's lines. Like, You'll see a lot of show and goes today. <laughs> she'll go down whenever she can. <laughs> she did one early doors, didn't yeah, she? she did. I think I said on From commentary. A kick return, wasn't it? She did a show and go. She scored a try and she nailed a touchline conversion. I, I said, get her off after fifteen. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's ticked all the boxes. She went there for the full experience, yeah. and she was she was definitely but giving us. She was the determined show. to get a crossfield kicker over the line, though. Wasn't she? Yeah, <laughs> it was like three yeah, in the first yeah. ten minutes. But <laughs> in all seriousness, I know she's a very good friend of mine. But what a way to finish her career! Yeah. It, she, you know, she's not somebody that's just taking the field every now and again I, I genuinely think she's changed the women's game yeah. um, so to have her see her out like that I think was a very very fitting time for her, her journey has been I mean I, I, I know people are getting really bored of look how far it's come etc but so, I know I actually heard you say that but mm. I was preempting it but her journey <laughs> is it is extraordinary from I mean even just I mean, for, she will be forever be the first person female rugby player on the front page of the Times and the Telegraph. And do you know, I was thinking in her retirement, I was thinking about, do you remember that time I came out to essentially bring you all home, having won the World <laughs> Cup that time? <laughs> what I was thinking about Katie Daly McLean is the interview I did with her at the front of the bus. 10 o'clock in the morning. No, that was the second one. So we'd <laughs> already done a sit down in the hotel with her. And I know, is she MBEOB? So she's sort of quite high up in the ladder of some sorts, isn't she? MBA, highly yeah. respected. Yeah. Mm. I think I could probably get that removed quite quickly <laughs> with the rushes from that interview. <gasps> You think you've had some moments in, in your time where you've celebrated too hard and then someone's put a camera in front of you. Holy Moses. I mean, nothing that came out was English. <laughs> it was just like, it's like Africans. Geordie Burr as well. It was just like, it was just sort of noise that fell out into the microphone. I was like, okay, well, we'll try again. And i have taken the papers to show her and she sort of just you know, rubbed her face on it. It's just like, I think O2 Inside Line, who are trying to create this amazing piece of footage to sort of celebrate just England's not triumph. Right now. Not just right now. Right 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 it's like Katie started eating the mic. It was just, it was amazing. Amazing. That doesn't detract from her remarkable achievement. Throughout the course of her We're career. We're going to have her on at some point and she yeah, can... Yeah, exactly. Well, I, might, I might see a photo inside line and find, yeah. find the rushes <laughs> because we could just do a quiet hatchet job on one of the greats. We can definitely use the rushes and then get her on to yes, come tell exactly. her side of the story. <laughs> yeah. Maybe what you were saying was unintelligible yeah. as well. Yes, possibly. Possibly yeah. my fault. Yes. So um, outside of the, the fact that she definitely took the opportunity and make the mo- made the most of it, what did you love about Saturday's game? It was very one-sided. Yeah, but I, th- I think um, we sort of would have expected that. I know that South Africa... Um, aren't quite where they want to be yet. There's a big journey there for mm-hmm. them to have. Um, but I still actually when I when I was watching it, um, it didn't make me think about the, the, all the chat about the Lions. And then you're seeing all the, the the players that were in that Barbarians team, and you're like, well, actually, if you put a good team together, they just get better anyway. Yeah. Um, so and you put good players in a different environment, they could actually be better players, which you you sometimes forget about. So uh, I just thought it was a great showpiece, and they clearly so enjoyed themselves mm. I, I thought the celebrations were slightly off the chart there was dancing yeah. I was watching t- TikToks of them dancing on the sideline when they were doing it, it was, there's was Mo's pictures of her just standing there at the end I mean they absolutely loved it and I and that's that's why you should be playing the sport. I, I like the fact you went with the, sort of the high brow. You know, it's good for the women's game and progress. I was going to literally pick out Rocky Clark's <laughs> social media activity. I mean, <laughs> she's sort of she's quite a regular. The best week. Well, I, she's quite a regular poster anyway. But I mean, like the volumes of coming out of, <laughs> of dancing in the changing room and dancing in the um, in the team room. I mean, there was a lot of choreography going on, um, <laughs> even on the pitch as well at times. Yeah, but I thought, I mean, even down to the NFL stuff, you know, the rolling and yeah. the, the, I still can't believe Rocky Clark, she's about 102 years old, was the one rolling around on the floor and Simi Pam was the NFL quarter, uh, the whatever they call them. What Snapper. do they call them? Snapper. Snapper. Yeah. I, I can absolutely I believe Rocky, Rocky Clark rolling around well, yeah, the floor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I was sort of like, what's, 
what what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> but that was the point, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it did make you look twice. And and it, what I love about the women's barbarians is they so very clearly don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah. Um, and it's it's so attractive. It's so entertaining. Um, even in the week leading up to it, in, out of the Springrock camp, the stuff that you saw, um, Eloise Webb and Zintle and Pupa taped with, um, uh, literally with injury tape, to toilet rolls to their heads. <laughs> and they were making these minions, you know, videos on TikTok <laughs> and stuff. And it, it was very clear that everyone was just kind of, this is the week for everyone to just kind of cut yeah. loose and have some fun, not just on the pitch. Obviously, they were very serious about trying to to put in a good performance at the end of their tour. Um, but the vibe just did seem to kind of be a little lighter on both sides. So good. And it's so important as well, because Tins will know, that, well, and maybe a bit different back in your era, actually. No, they all the grunt, they just grunted <laughs> each other. <laughs> she, she, just, she just threw me back in an era. And your era. You've got so a black and white job on the back of that comment. Years. I'm not even a generation <laughs> over the, over the scares. <laughs> what I was going to say was, obviously things are so professional now mm. and obviously everyone takes it incredibly serious and all that sort of stuff but I think you mentioned it earlier just the smiles on people's faces mm. which you know for some of those players who've played so many years and done so many things and blah 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 they probably never genuinely enjoyed a rhythm match as much as they've enjoyed that one mm-hmm. yeah and it is but it's unbelievable it's so and for the important. South Africans yeah. as well to be at Twickenham in front of that many people we were talking earlier weren't we in terms of how big a thing that is for them and where they are in their journey and all that sort of stuff amazing you had a, quite an accolade this weekend <laughs> Yeah. I'm, Are you allowed I'm, to share? I, yes, I'm still a little embarrassed about it. I don't know why they asked me, but the Springbok women's, well, Lynn Cantwell reached out and said, would you come present the shirt? So good. Um, and I immediately said, you, you cannot possibly be serious. There is nothing that qualifies me for this. Um, and as soon as I walked into the room, they were all really friendly and nice. And I said, I still can't believe I'm in here. I'm just a really big fan of yours. So, you know, I don't want this to be serious and impersonal. I'm just here to say, yay, go you. Um, <laughs> but it was really cool to see the the spontaneity in that team is different to anything I've seen from men's teams in South Africa. Um, they are warm and enthusiastic and really young. Yeah. And I think that that also changes the character of, you know, a group a little bit. How much How much is this experience? Because you were saying that quite a lot probably have never left South Africa before. Yeah. So how much is that going to be of an eye-opener for, for them and what's out there and, and how is it going to change their approach to everyday life? Huge. I think, I don't think people understand how... Um, this group, most of them had never left the country ever before. They played a series against Kenya earlier this year in Stellenbosch at a university pitch, you know, and they played at Twickenham this weekend. It is huge to leave the country for the first time in your life in, you know, your early 20s and to be able to do it and play in the same jersey that the men's team who are world champions are wearing. Um, even if in in many of the girls' case, your family doesn't have enough money to buy enough data so that you can have a WhatsApp call with them once in four weeks. I mean, some of these girls have overcome such incredible odds and they are studying and they are pursuing rugby as, as seriously as they possibly can. But they, they are also, and I think this is what, what a lot of people didn't talk about, is they knew coming on this tour that they were going to take some massive hits they were going to lose and they were going to they they were going to just have to stay in there and keep playing because the point wasn't to, to to earn a big win over the barbarians or earn a big win over france no one's expecting that but to keep going so you're what 39 nil down at half time and to go all right let's go out there for some more of this this time we're going to try and get on the board typified in that malinga try ayanda malinga absolute showstopper try so for the for me the try of the match obviously I'm a little biased but (laughs) really a beautiful try just someone who you know worked and was not about to be stopped um for that moment to happen was really I think well deserved um and also that's the thing that's kind of gone a little viral after the game I love that I've seen people sharing it who've never paid any attention to women's rugby in South Africa which is it makes it feel you know worthwhile I think you're. I think you're absolutely spot on. Funny enough, and I'm just sort of thinking, almost the last six months to a year is the women's game is obviously it's creating headlines for the right reasons, but it is very, very good at selling itself as well. There are such natural characters within the game, and I think, I think, funny enough, 
you are showing, well, the women's game is showing the men's game a lot of how it can promote itself and unlock characters. And I think we actually had Ellis and Freddie Stewart on this week. And both of them were sort of talking about the fact that actually rugby has gone back to being in, in the men's game about people, not just players. And I think the women's game has actually been very instrumental in showing that. And the point you're making about, because I, I saw the, was it, was it the England under 20s that South mm. Africa trained against? Mm. And there was an amazing sort of gathering off the back of it. And it's really heartwarming content. It's hugely inspiring if you're a if you're a young girl in South Africa to get into it. But actually, for those old cynics like you know the, the man alongside and I, it's sort of really it it makes you fall in love with the game again type of thing. And I think I think it's been it's been a really refreshing mm. twelve months mm. in the women's game because I don't think people are now talking about look how far it's coming anymore. People are now talking about the game standing on its own two feet and the characters that are coming through and the celebrations that we're seeing. I think mm. it's fantastic. And I want to see that that women's box side really now begin to kick on off the back of it because you know you've had the exposure, you've had the opportunity, you know what it is. Now what can you do? Type thing. And the good news is Lynn Cantwell did say that they have some more tests lined up for next year before they get to the World Cup because they're in such a tough pool. They're with France and with Fiji and who's the other team in their pool? Oh. I'm not sure. So <laughs> I know ours. <laughs> I can't recall. It's, it's tough, yeah. But it's it's a tough pool that they're in. Um, but they ha- they will have some more international experience before they get there because only two of those girls had more than twenty caps. What does it? What does it, Where does Lynn think they are on the journey from almost scratch mm. to, to trying to become competitive? It's obviously early days, but does, is she seeing the progress? That she wants to see. Well, it look she looks incredibly determined. Um, one of the things she did say to me before I left the other day was that her big next focus now is to find, figure out, create opportunities to get girls playing in South Africa. Because I don't know where they found all of these women's rugby players because there are so few places, clubs, universities that actually offer space for women to play. It's Definitely not something that is accessible in, in, the, in the schools that produce the men's players, like that I can tell you, where women play rugby in very different parts of South Africa. And women's rugby is dominated by Border, which is an Eastern Cape team. Um, it's, you know, it's really the heartland of Corsa rugby in South Africa. And it's very different to rugby in on the men's side being dominated by teams in Pretoria and Johannesburg and Cape Town. It's rural um, it's deeply cultural. It's um, it doesn't have any transformation issues whatsoever. There are very few Afrikaans white girls playing rugby. Yeah. Um, so its its entire character is, sh- is 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 shifting because it's growing, but it doesn't have any of the hang-ups. I think that there's still a very long way to go. But what we saw is insane amounts of talent and athleticism. From some of those players, like I, I think the the pleasing thing for me is you can learn the structure and the teamy bit and all that, and that's just time together, isn't it? Which hopefully they'll have a lot more of. But that try that we just spoke about, mm. Namba, the other winger, mm. was just absolutely whacking people. The physicality, that side of it, the the mental side of stuff, mm. and was amazing. I think there's some real potential in some of those players. They just need time together and they need mm. more opportunities. What I would say is Lynn Cantwell is a brilliant brilliant woman she was a phenomenal player when she played I'm sure uh, um, she's doing a brilliant job obviously COVID isn't helping in terms of her ability to be out there and whatnot but um, if anybody's going to kind of help and really push that on it's going to be challenging for her she's going to have to think on her feet a little bit it's going to be unorthodox the way she's got to do it she's going to have to change it but I'll tell you what she's fully embedded in South African rugby though because we did the Lions breakfast in the summer didn't we and she came on to one of those and I remember finishing by answering, answering I think it was after the second test I said who's, who's going to um, who's going to win the series and she saw, I was expecting her to say you know Irish legend the Lions and she was like well yeah but, you know, I'd love to see South Africa do it I, sort of teeth fell out the on, my, on the floor so, so at least she's in it for the right reasons there's a definite kind of um there's a definite passion for what she's doing there, which is great to see. It's like it's like when Sean Edwards first sang the Welsh national anthem. He's like, yeah, <laughs> he's trying. Ochs and gochs, but he's getting there. 
Speak, yeah. Speaking of switching allegiances, there's been this uh, small matter of the fact that you can now claim your birthright and represent a different country entirely. My English is running out already. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my problems. <laughs> <laughs> a different country entirely. So if you played all of your tests career for England, for example, but you were born in Samoa, and if you haven't played for three years, you can now claim the right after you've gone through some procedural processes to actually go play for Samoa, whatever, whatever other country you were born in or have a grandparent in. Grandparent history, hist- ancestry. You, you need it? to be able to prove that you have some sort of claim there. Um, a lot of people spoke about this in the context of the Pacific Islanders. I did make the point that the beast could now run out for Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. So we were talking about Zim the other day on the show. And actually, your mm. mate, Wig, I actually read it off Wikipedia, the number of South African players <laughs> yep. who yeah, could have yeah. played for Zimbabwe. And I think... People on the pod thought that I just was recounting. I was actually reading, reading off a sheet. But Zim could be an unbelievable beneficiary of this. Yeah, yeah. Namibia maybe as well. There are some rugby nations that you might be surprised because, you know, people have heritage and, you know, either side of the border. Yeah. Um, so, so that would be interesting to see the surprise ones. The obvious ones are the Pacific Islands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there might be a few. I, I Obviously, it's grandparents first and foremost. I'd love it if it was mother-in-law's. I'd love to see you made to go and play for Scotland. Like the way you've, so by being made, I've obviously done something wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> again, I would go so far as to say. No, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, who would you go for? I mean, I, would, I mean, I'd go for a real stereotype because I'd love to do the hacker one. Would you? Yeah. Definitely wouldn't get in the team. Have you got any <laughs> Kiwi ancestry? <laughs> exactly. As a water boy, you'd be very <laughs> yeah. fearsome at the front. Why is the water boy do, do the hacker at the back? I'd the, like yeah, that, that would be good. We asked you this earlier. Go on. <laughs> I'm not saying the same thing. Go on, do it again. <laughs> She's like, I have no other other blood in me other than English. Of course you don't. The English rose. Okay. Spiritually. <laughs> Spiritually. Is oh, there another culture that you love absorbing yourself in? Is there a team that just seems to play the kind of way that you'd love to go play? I think from playing a lot of sevens, Fiji would be very cool. In just in terms of how they play the game. Yeah. It's very loose. Everything's trying to keep the ball alive, isn't it? Not, I don't know if I'd be very good at that, but I think it seems fun. It seems they like... They play with massive smiles, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Everything is fun, enjoyment. They can always dance. Would I inherit the abilities to dance and sing as well? Because they can always, always dance. <laughs> but you're dance good at singing, sing. aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> you you're going to be a Christmas single by Emily Scout. I think we may have found her <laughs> kryptonite. Uh, yes. <laughs> Bradley it's taken Cooper. a long time, exactly. <laughs> Bradley Cooper over here has been uh, trying to get this going. It's not, it's not worked, it's though, not is it? it? No. Oh. Live show, though. I'm falling And all the good times I find myself along here. So you'd well, do Before Fiji. she's back fit, Yeah, you? I reckon. I reckon what, what would you do? Cool. Ooh. Um, I think in the women's game, if I could play for anyone I'd actually love to play for France wow I just love their swagger yeah I'm sorry as Elma said that she eyeballed me and yeah, I was she like did. she's going to say England she's going to say England <laughs> <laughs> she just uh, I love the friction that's built here. I'm just going to sit back and let you guys yeah. sort this out <laughs> but actually the men's game like both the French teams at the moment they just they, they're so cool I can see you as a sort of Jesse Tremoulier with the wind yes, in the hair yes I would, I would definitely play with my hair loose yeah exactly like I would have it done just you'd for the a, game you'd have a hair spot shit it, deal you'd be doing a lot of with this it, as you can do conversions and pay a person with a fan <laughs> to just follow yeah, exactly. around <laughs> sort of blowing like the Beyonce of rugby <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, yeah I, I would love that I, I mean being able to just play like that at all for any team would, would be nice but yeah. uh, but they do seem to have I always think that playing for the Pumas when they're when they're on, when they've done their World Cup prayer, yeah, and they awesome. come in and they get right, twenty fifteen or whatever, yeah, cry during the anthem. Yeah. There aren't many that produce the passion no. in the same way that they do. They, they whatever they drink before the game works enormously. <laughs> what do you think of the overall rule though? Because and, and it's interesting because you were talking about obviously handing out the shirts for the bo- the, the Bok ladies at the weekend, and I can see exactly why. I mean, you are you, you've done a huge amount in the world game and full world rugby, and therefore you have spoken probably with more international players than most. You know, what do you make of the overall rule of a second chance? Look, South Africa could probably make up a team of South Africans who are playing for other countries right now that would be rather formidable. Um, So I think we have a... 
a more flexible approach to being able to play test rugby. If if you're not going to play it in a green jersey, but you can play it in a Scotland one, then you know, <laughs> go go be I'll play against your brother in the summer. Yeah, or yeah exactly. Yeah. Go go be the best you you can be. If you find somewhere where they develop your talent, then go d- for it. does that sit comfortably with. People back home. I think I thought Duan van der Merwe got a bit of bit of it in the uh, in the summer, didn't he? Oh, he did. But I don't think well, anyone genuinely begrudges him okay. the opportunity because Duan grew so much in the uh, in the time since he moved to Scotland. He wasn't talked about mm. as someone who would have made it as a Springbok in the form that he was in when he left. And he seems to really have worked hard um, and found his groove somewhere else. And similar kind of story around CJ Stander. Um, there's just so many guys like that that you're just happy for them that they got the opportunity to play at the level that they got to play at and that we we still got to see their talent displayed even if it wasn't in the country of their birth. Um, I, I mean, you, you listen to people like James Lowe talk about um, growing up wanting to play for the All Blacks and now playing for Ireland and managing to have beaten the All Blacks. And um, I feel like in people look at this very romantically. Um, you know, I'm all English, you know, like just English blood, as as Emily would say. Um, and I'm a white African. So clearly I'm a walking, talking, you know, example of the fact that we move. We have been moving for a few hundred years. Um, economic migrants, it's almost like it's a word that has a stigma to it. But we move these days. We live in interesting places. We've all, um, you know, had opportunities to go do some interesting jobs. Sometimes it's in a different town. Sometimes it's in a different country. Mm. Rugby is a profession. It's a job. If you're an excellent actor and you get a gig in Hollywood, then no one's going to begrudge you for taking it just because you're now starring in American movies and not in South African movies. Yeah, I mean, I... I... uh... I sort of understand why they've done it. I'm not sure I fully buy into it. I sort of think once you once you pin your colours to a mast, mm. I'm sort of almost. I, I wonder whether there should be a cap on it. So if you play thirty More times for so a country, times, yeah. I mean, I, the only but the, 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 so what they are trying to do is obviously help the Pacific Islanders mm. and their people who are offered scholarships from Australia and uh, well, England, Australia. New Zealand, and then they're fully schooled there, and they play schoolboy rugby there. Then you would expect them to play for like, as Manu or as Billy for for England. But what they also want to do, I think, is the main reason for doing it is that if they're not then getting picked, mm. give them a chance to go back and support the nation where they were born if they want to do that. And and if you think about the good of the game, and you don't think about just sticking in with you know stubborn being stubborn about what rugby is and you should be proud to play for your nation you should for the good of the game we should probably allow that to happen because they'll get more people playing it if they can get those those big names who have played for a tier one before and there's yeah. some potentially mega teams being formed I know. Isn't yeah. it? That, that, that's been the game on social media yeah. this week <laughs> pick, your, pick your players and put them back in I, 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 I agree with you I think I mean, if you look at someone like a Samisa Rokundanguni who's played four times for England or a Nathan Hughes who's played 10 times, whatever it might be, even a Deli, Denny Sol- Solomona who actually has left sail and gone well, back to the Southern Hemisphere. You know, I think those guys is absolutely right. If you don't play for three years and you've had a couple of runs of it but you've obviously not made it, then absolutely go and have another go at it. If you're Mar Nonu and you've won the World Cup twice with the All Blacks, <laughs> you've got 120 caps and then four years later you're running up a smell, I think there's something that's a bit, yeah. I mean, it's brilliant for the game. <laughs> But it's it's sort of a, it makes it a bit slightly too different, transactional, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm, well, I don't know. I'm not sure you'll get that many of of those, will you? I don't think you'll get many sixty plus cappers who will then go and change. I where I think, where I would think it there be? Are a few being banded about. Perhaps. But I remember you know Rocco Rocco Coco. Yeah, he had sixty eight caps and he left and went to France, and then he was like 25. Yeah. <laughs> 25. <laughs> so you know he could have he could come back at twenty eight and. And he was still so good when we played talking about barbarians. Just watching him train, you're like, yeah, 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 you're good. Why? Was, what was it? What speed, power, the, the everything, long? everything. I mean, he sold me on the dummy playing touch, right? <laughs> where he's, gone. Where he's, how, like, how, how drunk were you at this point? <laughs> <laughs> he's literally, he's like shaped that he's going to throw a massive miss pass, and he's literally launched it, spun. With the ball in his still hands, I've still gone that way, and he's spun, and then he's got the wheels that he's just gone down there, and I'm like, oh, what? Who there? Who, who there? Give me, give me another ball. Yeah. yeah, I was like, 
vodka soda, please. <laughs> oh, he did that. He ran that in '03. That was his little. He was always cartwheeling. Yeah, I don't he, know lo- he loved the old, and he got me a good one. At Box office. Bit like you, Skaz. <laughs> yeah. Bit like you. Nothing like me. Come on, uh, she can't do the spin uh, anymore. Her ankle stays in the same spot. (laughs) Not not for a few weeks or months. Just just give her a month or so. She's going to be back and she's going to make her return. And speaking of returns, she will make her return. Don't don't do the cross fingers thing with putting it out there. Speaking of making a return, the uh, Allianz Premier 15s made a return and I feel like it went a little unnoticed because there was a lot of other rugby to talk about or the lack thereof to talk about (laughs) over the weekend with the men. Um, But we do have the resumption of domestic women's rugby in the UK and the good news to go with it that you'll now not only be streaming it on their own platforms but also on the BBC. So, so good. Um, I haven't actually looked at the fixtures of of which games Mm. will be the ones that are on the BBC stuff but um, yeah, amazing, amazing opportunity. I think the numbers that came out of the autumn, again, yes, that's international rugby, but the numbers that came out of people that watched the autumn, um, like a million viewers, I think the third test, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. Or something like that. So the appetite is there. So we've got to put it where people can see it if they want to. Um, and I think that's a brilliant step forward. I think some of the games that are being played in the Allianz Premier 15s are more competitive than some of the internationals that people will have just watched and, mm. and that's what people want to watch. So hopefully if that continues, um, the Gloucester Saris game at the weekend, for example, came down to a Zoe Harrison last minute penalty to, to kill it at the death. Um, so things like that, super competitive. Um, yeah, brilliant thing for the game. Brilliant thing for the game. We'll hear Mo's voice a lot on them as well. I think she's doing a lot of the comps. Like she's, Is she? She's got herself well, uh, well wedged in there for the oh, uh, yeah. Brilliant. Actually, when she's not playing, obviously. Yeah. And you? Oh, I'm not sure. Not, not sure. Not yet. We'll see. She's Con- taken them all. Contract negotiations. I got asked. I got asked to do the the Gloucester series yeah. game, but we we're at Dungannon. So oh. I couldn't, uh, couldn't what I was going to say, just very quickly, is that after we got back from Dungannon yesterday, feeling quite worse for wear. I took my 11-year-old Martha to go and watch England netball take on Jamaica at the Copper Box. And it was unbelievable. The, the game itself was sensational. But what was really interesting, looking at it from a sort of a television sponsorship type background, is it is so unbelievable to see how quickly that has come together with the backing of Vitality, who've done an unbelievable job with it, and the backing of Sky, who've mm-hmm. said we'll give it proper, regular Availability for everybody to watch. And I cannot tell you how excited my daughter was. We had a friend of ours presenting it in Die Doherty. It's just a really slick operation. And I just was sort of hanging out there, which is, I think, the Premier 15 is, is coming on the rails. And there are some very, very good players, some very, very good games in there. But until you've got a big brand who stands mm. alongside it, and Alliance are, are now doing that, and you've got a big broadcaster who can say, right, we'll give it proper exposure in the right channels at the right times it's very hard i think to engage an audience when they're not quite sure what they're getting so i'm really hopeful that this will will see some regular and and significant progress mm-hmm. just in terms of the overall product and the crowd sizes and the the knowledge of who's doing what and the characters involved um it's just really interesting to compare I think it, I think the, the women's game has, has sort of bounced around a little bit. I hope that this is now a proper, permanent foundation for it to kick on. In, and I, I love game. that it's that it's on the BBC. I mean, Brilliant. at the moment, it's going to be streaming once you know one game a week. But you're you're kind of hoping that you know the playoffs, the semi-finals, the final, that stuff ends up on BBC Two. You've got proof that it works because you had three million viewers over the autumn internationals. Um, and being on free to air, I think is. I mean, Huge. that's a quantum Huge. leap. Yeah, I think, and you just want another another couple of big sponsors to come in there and lend their sort of power as well, and and you and give and give the girls a chance to play and yeah. give them a couple sh- loads. Yeah. Well, loads. Yeah. Well, yeah. Loads. Like, well, as many as possible. <laughs> you, you've got most of them already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you share yeah. a couple? <laughs> <laughs> you used to didn't have a tattoo. Now you just got sponsorship <laughs> tattoos all over you. Um, yeah, I, I just I just think. It's got to start and it's got to start the wheel rolling down the hill and it, hopefully it'll just gather momentum. What is going to be interesting to see is where this league grows to. I had a conversation with someone because Katha Jacobs Jakobs is, has stayed behind. So the, the women box went back home. Zintle and Pupa is at Exeter. And Katha stayed behind because she's 
probably maybe possibly joining uh Prem 15's team. Are you giving away year. trade secrets before no, they've been No, it's, it's reported everywhere. It's like on Speculate. websites all over okay. South Africa. I'm is, just, she, is she signed to one or is she out for tender? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know exactly what this, the state of play is right now. I'm also not her agent. So, but, but, yet. But, but what, I, what I am interested in is whether that is going to end up happening, is that they just bring women in from all over because this is a league that's well-funded, well-run, gives women an opportunity to play regularly. Um, and they're certainly probably earning a little more here uh, than you would in, for example, ZARs. But we'll see how that develops. Yeah, I think we've definitely seen it. There's a, a massive amount of Americans, Canadians at the moment that are over here um, plying their trade because they it's a better standard of rugby and they get to play it more regularly. So I think, yeah, definitely we'll hopefully see lots more people like that and it will just strengthen the league. I'm really enjoying this. And Tins, for the first time ever, is going to break up the party. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. Wow. You've got to run. He has a karaoke gig he needs to uh, make. Yeah. I've, got He's to go been... pra- I've got to go practice. <laughs> this has just been the, the voice warm-up. Uh, we <laughs> are the good, the scars and the rugby and uh, will hopefully be in your eardrums on your screen from uh, this year's studio again uh, very soon. Thank you so much for coming through, Emily Scarrett, and for joining our special guest, Alex Payne. Thank you for having me. God, if only Good, Bad and Rugby had a proper presenter, eh? <laughs> where would that be now? Good on the Alma. <laughs> Stop it, I like it.